I've been in St. Louis for the past 30 years working with iTest. Now let me tell you what that means. The long and short of it is it's Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology and we shorten it to iTest. What we do in iTest is look at advances in science and technology and what those advances mean for the Christian faith. Then our mission, to shorten it, is to, iTest's mission is to demonstrate that faith and science are complementary paths to truth, to God. So they work along in a complementary manner. There is an intersection between faith and science that you'll hear some of our scientists speak about very beautifully. Now, how did this program come about? First of all, let me invite you, before I do that, to join us in iTest. We are stationed at the Archdiocese of St. Louis at the Regali Center presently. We have membership all over the world, and you don't have to sign, you don't have to take an exam to become a member of iTest. If you're a physician, or if you scrub floors, as I sometimes do, we welcome all of you, because we should all have an interest in what science and technology is doing today. We're living in a scientific technological age, for sure, and when I talk to people about eye tests, they'll say, I don't know anything about science. I don't think that would interest me. And I say to them, do you have a cell phone? You are interested in technology. Therefore, there is an interest in science. So let me tell you a little bit about this program. Back, way back in the days of 1980s, Father Bob Brungs, our Jesuit director, often used to say to me, I wonder how we can get enough interest to surface some of the scientists from the parishes to tell us about what their science is, what their technology is, how, what they do in nursing or as a physician, and what that means for their faith, if anything. We really need to surface these scientists. So at that point, we didn't have the money to do it, but many years later, we pr did a proposal, uh, Tom Sheehan, our director now, and I and our board worked on a proposal to our Sunday Visitor Institute. You all know our Sunday Visitor. If you don't, you should. Anyway, we submitted a proposal and we asked if we could get some funding for surfacing this kind of, of scientists and engineers from our parishes. It's so important to start things in parishes because that's where our people are. That's where the faith is. We did get a, a small grant for working with this and as a result we started contacting parishes. We got in touch with the parishes around the Archdiocese, and our first response was 14 parishes responded that they were interested. And we did follow up with them. I met with every one of the adult formation coordinators, told them what it was that we expected of them, and what they could expect from us as far as help was concerned. So, our first one was at, um, it was Ascension Parish here in, in Crevecourt in St. Louis, and the audience was fantastic. We had 225 people at that meeting. The, uh, the, the organization of it was fantastic. We had a physician, a neuroscientist, and a theologian speak at that meeting. Everything went beautifully. What happens after a meeting like this? Because you'll be hearing from our own scientists and, and physician here today, or at least on this video you will. Well, they spoke of their science, they spoke of their faith. Everything went beautifully. What happens after? We had questions from the audience. We expect that this kind of a program will proliferate around the United States. And we're working now with St. Joseph's Radio and TV, which will be the purveyors of this particular program. We don't want it just to be in six parishes around the Archdiocese. We want this to go out to the entire nation. And we will have, pro we will have program materials that will help facilitators do this. ITEST is always ready to help with this, and so is St. Joseph's. 
Let me just say one word here about conflict and science. One of our board members teaches at a high school here. She teaches physics in, in, the, in the freshman class. The first question she asks them in her physics class is, how many of you think there is a conflict between faith and science? 80% of the eighth graders who are now freshmen raise their hands and say yes. This is the kind of thing we see that can be worked on in our program that we're doing. The program is scientists speak of their faith, a model for a parish discussion. It has gone well so far. We hope that we know that it will continue. And I want to leave you with one message that comes back to me from Father Bob Brungs, our director and founder of iTest. He said, rest assured that a Christian in science and technology is the presence of Christ in science and technology. I was born into a Catholic family, and I can remember at a very young age um, praying with uh, my family together and having that, that initial seed of the faith from my youth. But as I got older, I started to drift away from the Catholic faith. This happened somewhere around middle school. I had many questions about the faith, many things that I, weren't quite, I wasn't quite sure about, um, and I wasn't quite sure where to find the answers either. Um, I had tried asking other people, and while they could reiterate what the church taught, my questions of why and how didn't seem to be answered. And so I was a little frustrated and confused by that. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's common, a common experience for many of our youth these days. Uh, I did also find it rather easy um, to move forward with math and science. Um, one of the reasons behind that was because Generally, everybody seemed to agree as to what the rules of math were. Everybody seemed to agree as to the results of what the observations and experiments and science seemed to indicate. Um, but not everybody seemed to agree when it came to matters of faith. And so that seemed to be a, a problem. And faith kind of seemed to me at that time more of an issue of opinion rather than something about truth. Um, whereas it seemed as though maybe truth could be found in math and science. And so for me at that young age, in the middle school, um, there seemed to be a divide between the two. Uh, the two didn't necessarily seem to, to coincide. They didn't seem to really agree as far as I understood them at that time. And so they were kind of separated for me at that young age. And so the question becomes, is there really a conflict between the two? Is there a discrepancy between the two? Can faith and reason get along, or must they be at odds? Um, in the Catholic Church, uh, we have a great gift in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is kind of a summary of our faith. And so when we have questions about the faith, that's one of the first places that we ought to look. And within the Catechism itself, um, on number 159, it talks a bit about this subject matter, the relationship between faith and science. And it says that there can't really be a discrepancy. Um, and the reason behind that is because what we know by faith is being revealed to us by God. And what we know by science comes from observation and experimentation of the world around us. But where does that world come from? That too comes from God. And so God is not going to contradict himself. He's not going to tell us one thing by faith and then have us discover something different by science. So the two really cannot contradict themselves or each other because they come from the same God.
like to go through is uh, looking at the creation of the world. So we know that God gives us information about the creation of the world through Holy Scripture, through the Bible. And the first chapter of the Bible is Genesis 1. And we read in there, in Genesis 1, that it takes six days from the moment that God starts to create to get to the moment where we have human beings. Um, but that seems to be at odds with what we have with regards to what we're seeing in science. When we study the universe, it seems as if um, there have been billions of years between the moment that the universe started to exist to having human beings. And so there appears to be a conflict here. There appears to be a discrepancy. Uh, and so how do we resolve that? What do we do with that? Um, we need to go deeper and try to understand how to approach it. Now, whenever we look at scripture, uh, it's always important for us to keep in mind two principles. One, the historical, and two, the theological. With regards to the historical, we believe that God inspired human authors to write down certain pieces of information. But those authors, when they write these things, they're doing it in their specific time period, in a specific place, within a specific culture, using a specific language that includes all kinds of idioms, metaphors, and the language itself has its own variety of meanings for the different words. And so, when it comes to Genesis 1, we have to keep all of that in mind when we try to understand what is the intention of the author. What is the author of Genesis 1 trying to tell us? And if we look at the structure of Genesis 1, what we would discover, provided we're familiar with ancient Hebrew poetry, is that it's an ancient Hebrew poem. Um, and the structure is consistent with that of other uh, ancient Hebrew poets, uh, poems that are written. Um, and in this, in this structure of poetry, the first three days have a theme of separation, uh, where God is separating different things um, in order to create them and make distinctions. But in the last three days of the six, there's a theme of population. Now that we have these regions, these areas of creation, God then populates them. But we also see a connection between the days in the first set and the second set. So day one and day four are both talking about light. And day two and day five are both talking about water. And day three and day six are both talking about things regarding land. And so we see that this is structure of Hebrew poetry. Now whenever we think of poetry, are we looking for detailed historical information are we really looking for um, a scientific analysis of something? Uh, typically not when it comes to poetry. Um, and so we shouldn't treat it like that. We shouldn't treat it as if it was something that has that kind of information, because that's not what it is, and that's not what it's for. Um, but it's also important to look at the language itself. And in, eight, in the ancient Hebrew language, the word that they use for day is yom, which could mean a 24-hour period, but it could also mean a longer period of time, or, a, a, or simply a period of time. And so within the language itself, what they used for day doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period. Also, whenever we go through scripture and try to understand what the scriptures say and how we are to um, interpret them, we don't just look at scripture alone, we also look at what did the early Christians believe? How did they understand these scripture passages? And we also look to the church. What did the church teach, definitively teach about these passages? Things that we should and, and need to know. And so if we go as far back as the fifth century, and we look at what did the theologians say about Genesis 1 at that time, they knew some of them would promote and suggest that this is not intended to be a scientific document. Um, likewise, in the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII made a similar comment saying that this isn't intended to be a scientific explanation of how God created the universe.
but not only are they not opposed, because they both provide us with truth coming from God, then the two should complement each other. We should be getting similar information from the two different ways. And so if we look at um, the Big Bang Theory, um, with it we say that about 13.7 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was in a single incredibly tiny point. And that somehow that point then had some sort of hot rapid explosion which resulted in the universe which is continuing to expand um, even today. And the evidence for this theory of the Big Bang is that if we look through our telescopes and we look at the other galaxies, then we can tell that they are moving away from us and from each other. And so if we just reverse the process, if they're moving away, then let's look backwards in time and we see that they all come together to a single point. So what does that mean then? It means that there's a start to the universe. How did the universe come to be? Um, it seems that the universe was then created, that something must be outside of the universe that brought the universe into existence from nothing. And so there's a number of scientists who examined this information about the creation of the universe, and they had thought about um, how that relates to what we hear about in um, Genesis, in Holy Scripture. And so the astrophysicist Robert Jostro, um, he was originally kind of Gnostic and not sure what to believe, but after his investigations, um, he became fairly confident that what we see through science seems to match rather well, actually, with um, what is, appears in Scripture. So he says, uh, now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. And then I have quotes from additional scientists as well, um, from author Eddington, who is an expert in general relativity, uh, from Robert Wilson, um, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, and from George Smoot, uh, who also got a Nobel Prize. And he says that there is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. I found an interesting article a number of years ago from the Wall Street Journal, and in it, it kind of examined how science seems to be pushing us towards uh, a greater understanding or providing additional evidence for the existence of God. And so in that article, in the 1960s, um, scientists suggested that there were only really two parameters necessary in order for a planet to sustain life. And they said that that would be the, the kind of star that it is and the distance that planet is from that star. Well, if it's true that you only need those two parameters, then um, it would mean that there would be a septillion number of planets that could possibly have life within our universe. And so that's one with 24 zeros following it. That's a lot of planets that could have life. Um, and so that kind of captured the imagination of people such that, they, uh, that we see a lot of science fiction where there's all sorts of aliens all over the universe and a great plethora of them. Um, however, since the 1960s, they started to discover, oh, well, two parameters is actually not enough. There are other factors and things that we need to consider um, in order for there to actually be life on a planet. And so as they were discovering and realizing these additional factors, um, they would add it to the list, and the number of possible planets that we could have that would have life uh, was becoming much, much smaller. Um, and so the current list is somewhere over 200 parameters that are necessary for a planet to support life. Um, and if you put that into uh, statistical calculations, what does that mean for the likelihood of any planet in our universe being able to support life? And in that article it says, the number of possible planets hit zero. The odds turned against any planet in the universe supporting life, including this one. Probability said that we shouldn't be here, and yet here we are. So that doesn't seem to me to indicate that our existence is by random chance. It seems to imply and provide evidence for our existence being the result of design. 
And if this is by design, then there must be an intelligent designer. Back to my personal story. Uh, I had fallen away from the faith, but in college I started to come back. And while I gave some great examples of how the two are not opposed and how science and faith can actually work together, it wasn't any of those kinds of arguments that brought me back to the church, that brought me back to God. Rather, it was my own unhappiness, my own loneliness, my own desperation. I was uh, working as an undergraduate research assistant um, at Missouri Science and Technology, and uh, I was, um, it was during the summer, all my friends had gone home, I was very lonely, I was very unhappy, I was very upset, this took place for a number of weeks, um, and so I did something that I hadn't done in a very long time, and that was, I prayed. And at the beginning of that prayer, I was kind of like uncertain, not entirely sure, like, is there even really a, a God listening to me right now? But as I was praying, I was becoming even more confident in my prayer, even more sincere in my prayer. It was like as I was praying, God was strengthening me with his grace. And by the time I finished my prayer, by the time I had surrendered myself to the Lord, a peace came over me that I can't exactly explain where it came from. And I had asked for God to intervene in my life, to change it, to make it different, because I was so unhappy with the way that it was at that time. And he certainly did. Um, I started having strange thoughts, like, go to Mass. <laughs> I had been in college for a couple of years by that point. Um, it had never occurred to me that I should do that. Um, and other thoughts, like, go to the Catholic Newman Center. Uh, again, that is not something that I would have thought of, even though I would walk past it every day to go from my dormitory to the campus. Um, so that seems to imply that, you know, that's God inspiring this thought, um, bringing me closer to him by guiding me through such inspiration. And I was all fr afraid and uncertain. It's like, I don't know when to sit and stand at Mass. I don't know anybody there. I don't know that I want to do that. But I told you I would follow your lead, and I think you're telling me to do this, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I did, and it was awesome. Um, and I went to the Catholic Newman Center and I started to develop new friendships and, uh, and my faith life really started to take off. And so I, I had a personal relationship with God from that moment, but also um, God, in, through that personal relationship, drew me to a relationship with him through the, the community, drew me into a relationship with him through the Catholic Church. Um, and so as I was going deeper into the faith, some of the questions that I had from middle school started to be answered because I was finally able to look in places where those answers were being made available. And so it seems to me that oftentimes um, people start to think that the faith is unreasonable because they have questions. They see what appears to be discrepancies between what um, the church teaches or what the faith says and what they, they see in the scientific community and what they see in other places. Um, and I think the problem is that they start to think that the faith is unreasonable and they start to doubt it because they're not getting the answers to their questions. Because um, these reasons uh, for how there's not a discrepancy aren't being given to them. They're not aware of them. Um, and I think that if we started to talk about the faith more often with each other, if we started to be more willing to actually voice the, the difficulties we're having in our faith, the appearances of these conflicts, um, so that we can find these answers, I don't think so many people would think that there actually is a divide anymore. I have, to, I have to apologize at first to my wife. When I show you this, 
because this used to hang in my office at home for years. And one day she said to me, aren't you ever going to get rid of that? And so I did, but knowing that I might need it sometime in the future, I pulled it out of my secret hiding place this morning, and I'm, I'm sharing it with you tonight. So I know that the, uh, our time is getting late. I'm going to be brief, but in about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try and tell you where ideas come from. And I want to try to make a point and show you how this is connected to this and how you really can't have one without the other. Um, I had a farming accident when I was nine years old. I ended up in the hospital for three weeks. And I think that that was the event in my life that t led me to become a physician. When I was in medical school studying the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, I was blown away by this new language that I was learning. Locus cerealis, medial lemniscus, pyramidal decussation, globus pallidus, inducium grecium. These are all, believe it or not, anatomical parts of our brain. And I was just fascinated. I loved uh, th this new language. I loved how it all fit together. I loved the physiology of, of how it all worked. And yet it's still a, a huge mystery. Nobody has it all figured out. But that's how I ended up in neurosurgery. Um, what I, what I want to do, uh, what I'm going to talk about really stems from a discussion that I had recently with my son-in-law. Uh, he lives in New York City. We were together recently and he's a business guy. He thinks like a business guy and he's in charge of product development for this company that he works for. We were sitting there and he asks me, um, Dad, where do ideas come from? And so it got me thinking about that. You know, we just take it for granted. You know, how does an idea pop into our head? Uh, how do we come up with some of the, the, the crazy things that, that we say or that we think or the, that we end up doing? And so I'm going to give you a crash course on a little bit of neuroanatomy, a little bit of neurophysiology, and explain to you how coming up with an idea is biblical. So if you look at this poster here, this is just kind of a, uh, an artist's rendition of the central nervous system. And I just want to focus on a couple of important features. This area right here is called the brain stem. And then I want to talk about the emotional brain and the rational brain. Now, we get all of our information through our five senses. Sight, sound, taste, touch, um, and smell. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is audience participation. <laughs> so think of how simple that is. All the information that comes into our mind, if you will, comes in through those five senses. That information goes in through our eyes, our ears, through our hands, and enters this part of the brain right here. Father Lampy, right here. <laughs> From here, it goes up. And what's interesting is that you can, you can take this part of the brain and break it down into two components, what I call the emotional brain and the rational brain. The emotional brain is in this central portion right here. The rational brain is up here. Notice that in order for all of this information to get to the rational brain, it has to go through the emotional brain. And that's where we frequently get into trouble when we might hear something we don't like or someone does something to us. We immediately lurch out. We have a bad thought. And then we think, well, maybe they're right and maybe I shouldn't jump to conclusions like that because even though it takes a millionth of a second for the information to get here to here, it goes through here first. And so frequently we will react, uh, we'll, uh, we won't respond in the proper way.
read from Luke 24. This is the gospel reading from this last Sunday. And just to set the tone, this was right after the, uh, the two disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus when Jesus uh, opened their eyes through the breaking of the bread. They came back and they told the apostles and then it, and then it goes into this section. While they were still speaking about this, he, Jesus, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And so right there, there was a sound. They heard him speak. But get this. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. So the sound goes in the ear, boom, hits the emotional brain, and they're freaked out. Even though they spent three years with him, they knew who he was, they recognized his voice, they spent so much time with him, they let their emotional brain take over, they weren't thinking with their rational brain, and it says right here, they were startled and terrified. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? <laughs> Sometimes you can think of your heart as kind of your emotional brain. And so Jesus was recognizing that they were thinking with their emotional brain, not their rational brain. And that's why he asked the question. And then he says, look at my hands. Look at my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see. Again, he's using those senses, sight, sound. He, they they heard him speak. Now he wants them to touch his hands and his feet. He says, touch me and see because it is I. Touch me because a ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you can see, I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands. He showed them his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything here to eat? Now, why on earth would he do that? <laughs> but if you think about it in the context of these five senses in how we gather information, how we learn, how we come up with ideas, now he's asked for a piece of fish. They hand him a piece of baked fish. Now, I'm sure it had a smell. And then they watch him eat eat the fish. Now, when you eat fish, there's going to be obviously a taste. Now, the, the apostles didn't taste the fish, but they were certainly familiar with what a baked fish tasted like. And so he says, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Now, sometimes when you read things a thousand times it takes a thousand and one times to read it and click for it to make sense. And I've been very familiar with this passage for a long time. But it wasn't until this past Sunday that I read this in light of this talk coming up that it dawned on me that this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He is creating for them the ideas that's going to take them into their future mission, their future ministry when he leaves. So this is what he says next. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, these apostles prior to meeting Jesus and through their three years of spending time with him, they were familiar with Moses' laws. They were familiar with the Psalms. They were familiar with all the stories. They had read all those things, but it had not clicked. And Jesus is taking them softly and slowly and gently through this process using these five senses until finally it says in verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It was at that point, after using these five senses, after taking them slowly through this process, after allowing them to 
jump through their emotional brain and get over the shock of this to get to their rational brain with all the information they had gleaned throughout their development spiritually, throughout the time that they spent with Jesus, that he opened their minds, they understood, and they were ready and prepared to go forward and spread the message, spread the gospel, take over uh, in Jesus' place, uh, because Jesus knew that he wasn't going to be there very long. And uh, I, I just think that it's, it's something that we take for granted, our sight, our sound, our hearing, uh, all these things. But this is how uh, we gather our information. This is how we learn. This is how we develop. This is how we grow. And I wish that I would have knew about this when I tried to answer my son-in-law when he asked me, where do ideas come from? But I think that there's an excellent parallel between how our brains develop, how our minds develop, how we take this information, and how we go through these stages of development until one day the light clicks, the idea comes on, we understand, and our minds are open. had fallen away from the faith uh, for 20 years and then we joined a new parish and we sat down with the pastor and he said what activities are you going to be joining my wife knew that I hadn't been to mass in 20 years and the priest said can you sing and my wife goes no but my husband can sing so I was shanghaied into the choir and I'd not been in church in 20 years and here I was singing bass in the choir and also about that time I got a magazine called Sursum Corde, Lift Up Your Heart, uh, a, a throwaway magazine in the mail. I'd never got one before, and I never got one after. But it said, Presbyterian minister becomes Catholic. It was Scott Hahn's conversion story. So I read Scott Hahn's conversion story, and I'm going, this is a guy that's really smart. He knows the Bible backwards and forwards, and he gives up everything, his life, his, his friends, his church. He turns his back on them because he is drawn by the truth. And I was so impressed by that, I started reading all sorts of conversion stories, his and John Henry Cardinal Newman, and Newman saying to be deep into history is to cease to be Protestant, going back and reading the early church fathers. Because I'd never really thought about the Catholic faith being true. I just had it sort of spoon-fed to me. So in any case, I started going to Mass. I started reading everything I could get my hands on. And I was sort of a spiritual Catholic. I believed in the truth of Catholicism. But that's sort of narcissistic because religion is messy. Religion is dealing with other people, going to Mass. And so I'm in the choir. I started lecturing. I started bringing speakers in, including we had Scott Hahn come to, come to teach us at St. Anselm's. I uh, went back to Lourdes when my mother-in-law was dying of cancer. And as opposed to when I was in high school, it was one of the most beautiful experiences I can remember. They gave me a copy of the stories of the conversions and the miracles, one of which was a little boy who was Belgian, who was normal when he was two, then he was, got an infection of his eyes, and he was blind until he was age eight. So his mother takes him to Lourdes, he has communion, they take him to the baths, nothing happens. In Lourdes, the Stations of the Cross are up on this hillside. So back in the 30s, this woman is with her little blind boy. She's going up to the stations on her knees, then going back to the path to see the boy. And after he had taken the bath the day before, she comes back when she's on the stations. She's looking around. She can't find her son. She's looking and yelling. There's no one else there. Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre. She looks way up the hill. There is the little boy. She goes running up the hill, and here's little eight-year-old Jean-Pierre. He's down on the ground. He's picking up a twig and looking at this twig. And she says, are you okay? Are you okay? He looks up into her eyes, and he says, Mother, I never knew how beautiful you were. And that reminded me that I had forgotten how beautiful my mother, the church, was. I had forgotten. The seed was there, but I never knew why. So it was such a wonderful experience. The volunteers they had there, 
It was a wonderful experience. And then I saw at Lourdes that God, even if you're suffering, even if you're dying, that suffering is redemptive, that he truly loves his sons and daughters, that we are sons and daughters of God, we're wounded, but that, that we are still children of God. St. Augustine said, Thou hast created us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. C.S. Lewis says, there's only two ways of looking at life. You either say, thy will be done to God, or you say, my will be done. And to me, sometimes scientists want it to be, my will be done, and they want to understand everything from their point of view without God. Um, modern scientists think they want to be free, but there is no freedom without God. In the pre-modern world, mankind knew that there was sin, and the question is whether you were going to be saved. Now in the modern world, everybody thinks they're going to be saved and nobody believes in sin anymore. And Catholicism is looked at as moralistic, judgmental, guilt-ridden, and superstitious. But we are not free at all, and there is no happiness apart from God. One of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton, used to like to say that the secret of happiness is in humility and gratitude. And even the Greeks, Aristotle said, happiness is not a feeling or a superficial, but it's the true goodness of the soul. St. Augustine famously said, if you believe, then you will understand. And with Christ and with God, it's a relationship with a person. And so in order to understand, you must love first. And when you love, then you will believe and then you will understand. Uh, Chesterton had a famous expression that he used for people that would believe in science and reason. He said that poets and artists don't go mad, but logicians and scientists and accountants go mad. He said all that the poet wants to do is get his head up into the clouds. And the problem with the scientist, the scientist wants to get all of heaven inside of his head, and it is his head that splits. So when I was trying to figure it all out myself, I felt like I was getting a splitting headache. So the truth, truth is known by not just science, but by faith. Because the science can explain how, but faith explains why. And I understood that in my work when I would look into the eyes of patients and I see Christ in these patients. Um, the, the Aspects of God I think about are truth, goodness, and beauty, and scientists seek, seek the truth through reason, others seek goodness through the will, but what about the heart? The heart looks for joy and love and ecstasy and happiness, and as Pascal the philosopher said, the heart has its reason that reason knows not of. So we all want to be happy, but there is no happiness without God. And we must remember that Jesus is a real person. He became one of us, the staggering fact of the Incarnation. So if you love God, then you will understand. And how do you do this? Through prayer, through good works, through the sacraments of the Church, especially the Eucharist, when God becomes one of us and gives himself to us. I think that God loves us as his children. We are not evil. We are wounded sons and daughters of God. I think of the image of, of the divine mercy with the beautiful colors coming out from the chest of Christ where he was pierced by the spear on the crucifix. And I think of Calvary during the consecration when I'm looking at the cross and I'm seeing the wound in Christ's side and I'm seeing the light and I'm thinking in there, in his heart, is that fiery furnace of divine Trinitarian love. And what we are supposed to do is not figure it out ourselves. We're supposed to be incorporated into Christ. We are taken up into the life of the Trinity through our communication with Christ, especially through the Eucharist. And we're all swept up into that, into that fiery furnace, that radical self-giving love, the very life and love of God, the very joy that God has in himself. 
St. Paul said that Greeks look for wisdom and Jews look for signs, but Christianity is foolishness to the Greeks and stumbling block to the Jews. He also said, I only know Christ and him crucified. So I have to remind myself that life is a mystery, that life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. And as a scientist, I tell myself I am never going to understand it all, but that I should be humble and grateful for all of God's gifts, and that if I want to understand God, I should first believe and love God, and then I will understand. universe is orderly, and it is orderly. You know, this room, the gases are not orderly, they're going around every place. In the universe, we have galaxies, we have solar systems, we have planets, we have photosynthesis. What an orderly process. So, uh, the world is an orderly place. It's hard to imagine that uh, there's not some design about. But even with the, uh, the, the church's teaching right now, they don't care. They don't care if, uh, if they're not saying that God had to step in to create eyes. And God had to step in to uh, create the photosynthesis or even the planets or the motion. As far as they're concerned, if that's the way it is, if that's what science tells us, that's okay with them because the church knows who created all these things and who made the laws of physics such as this would happen at this eventually in time. So the church concerns itself with God and how it got there is incidental. And if they take the other approach, we have to remember that if you try to make uh, scripture match up to science, you're going to run into trouble because science changes. In the late 1800s, or starting with uh, Isaac Newton, and he, he made these equations in motion. And from the, the equations in motion, he said that if you had enough information, you could predict anything. You can predict eventually what's going to happen in 200 years and what happened 100 years ago. This is called determinism. And this said that there, there is no free will because physics uh, causes all these things to happen. Well, it turns out it's not true. The uh, Newton's laws of motion only work in a very narrow range. We have something called quantum theory. We have theory of relativity. Time is not constant. One hour for me is not the same as one hour for someone traveling near the speed of light. You know, so they, if you force scripture to match the science of the day, you're going to have to backtrack. Remember, scientists thought the earth was flat. You know, if you force scripture to make the earth flat, well, that's a mistake. So religion has to focus on God and observe and say, oh, this is interesting. And that is exactly what the church did. The church is the founder of science. And most of the early scientists were uh, priests because they were the one that had time to study and to do these things. Let me just look at, just read off a couple of these different uh, people. Copernicus. Remember the whole theory about the earth being the, the center and everything going around it? Well, he showed years before Galileo that that wasn't true. The church had no problem with it. Kepler showed that the motion, he was not a priest, it's Lutheran, but that's okay. Uh, he showed that the, they're not circles, they're, they're really 
uh, ellipse, ellipses. Uh, we had uh, Albert the Great classified planets. Roger Bayton developed the scientific method. Uh, um, Maureen Marcine was the father of acoustics. Uh, Gregory Mendel was the father of genetics. And George Lemaitre was the priest who should have gotten a Nobel Prize, who is one of two people that proposed what came to be known as the Big Bang Theory. And of course, the Big Bang Theory was not accepted very well because you had a number of enlightened physicists who didn't need God, who assumed that the universe has always existed. And they felt that if the universe has always existed, then you don't need God. And so when, when Lemaitre said, well, it looks like the universe is expanding, theoretically, uh, they said, everybody knew, well, if it's expanding, then you go back in time, you come to a point. And so they didn't accept it. And so it took to Hubble show that the universe is truly expanding, that this changed. The church accepts science, nods her head, and if science changes, well, that's okay. They, they know the real truth. They know the real source of everything. And they know from other things that Jesus came down and to be with us, and he redeemed us, and then the whole plan of salvation, they have that. But they don't really have a problem. And even nowadays, we talked about the whole argument about uh, uh, existing or not. There's things going on in physics uh, called the multiverse. And the multiverse says, well, there's not just one universe, because as Father showed, the, the the statistically, there should not be any planet with any people here. Well, they just say, well, there's more universes. And if you have enough universes, surely one of these will have the conditions right that there be people. Well, that's an attempt to go back to say that we don't need God. That the, our universe was created just as a statistical chance. There's another one. It's called the bouncing universes. And, and what it is, is it says that the universe expands and then the universe will contract and when it gets back to the small point, it's going to expand again. It's going to explode and start all over again. Go on, on and on, explode, come back, explode, come back. Okay? Well, that's another attempt of saying you don't need God. This has been going on for eons and eons and eons. Okay? So, but there's no proof of this. And so they have all these, these theorems that are unprovable. Uh, and they, they're going on this. And it doesn't really matter whether or not the, the, uh, this is the third time the universe has rebounded or not. It doesn't affect my life. It doesn't even affect the church's life. Uh, Father Cardinal Schoenbrunn said, basically said that if that's what it was, that's what it is. We still, everything is set in motion by God so that we can come into union with him. What's your advice for our young people? Um, my daughter in particular is planning to study sciences, um, chemical engineering at s and um, How can they remain Catholic in the company of their peers, their teachers, the workforce, and um, also more importantly, how can they bring the Catholic faith to that environment? Okay, so um, you can correct me if I'm summarizing this incorrectly. Um, so the question is, how uh, can we help our young people maintain their faith um, going into their careers and such, and the example specifically of your daughter 
going to uh, Rala, um, how does she remain Catholic and how um, can she share the faith with others? Is that correct? Okay. So um, one of the ways that we can try to maintain our faith is to surround ourselves with uh, people who also have the faith. God made us to be social creatures. Um, we are to be uh, coming to Christ together as part of a community, not as isolated individuals. And so those who go to different universities should take advantage of the Catholic resources available at those universities. Um, so Rala has a Catholic Newman Center, and that helped me in my own um, return to the Catholic faith. And so I would recommend that she would uh, take advantage of that opportunity to be with those fellow Catholics. Um, one of the great things about science is that you get to see all the ways that God has um, instilled this order into the universe. And so you can actually incorporate the, the scientific um, discoveries and the things that you learn from science uh, and just appreciate and present those back to God in prayer as well, um, recognizing the great beauty of the order that he has instilled inside of his own creation. Um, how do you really share that with others? Um, some people are open to it, some people aren't. Uh, my experience at Rala, um, some people, they will just not talk about it and they would avoid the subject matter, um, trying, to, trying to keep the peace because they may not share that same belief. Um, as far as like sharing it with others, um, I would just not be afraid to talk about it, but not like also try to proselytize people, try to force them uh, to believe the same thing, but to be open about it. So for example, if somebody asks, oh, what are you doing this weekend? Um, not to be afraid to say, oh, well, um, on Sunday morning, I'm going to go to Mass. Um, that's part of the weekend. It's a part of the person's reality. Uh, or, oh, at the Newman Center, we're going to have this uh, activity or whatever. Um, and then invite them to come along. Uh, to be very friendly, to be very open, uh, but not to like try to shy away from the faith or try to hide it, um, but not to try to force them either, um, but just to be very genuine and open with that. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. I think that the, the purpose of, of this organization is that the sciences tend to sometimes be a faithless uh, environment at some, at some level, and how do we bring the faith and encourage our young generation to bring the faith into the sciences, which is STEM is all over. So the young people are being encouraged to study the sciences, and how do we keep the faith a part of kind of a faithless environment? You have very successfully been able to do that. Okay, so the, um, how do we keep the faith in what seems to be a faithless environment? Uh, where we study the sciences, but the sciences are not presenting the fullness of reality, where they are leaving out certain parts. Um, well, I would say that would be the place to, to fill in those certain parts. Um, like I mentioned before, when we learn things in science, they may appear to conflict with religion, and so a question would arise. Well, not to leave that question open, but to actually find that answer. Like, okay, there appears to be a conflict. Well, let's get this resolved and not just believe, oh no, there's a conflict, now I have to choose one or the other, but to actually um, have the two put together uh, to see how they're not actually in conflict, even though they may appear to be. Um, and like I said before, to take those discoveries and realities that we have from science um, and, and bring that into to prayer as well, recognizing the great order of the universe. Um, would any of you like to add to that? So obviously, Christine, it really starts with what kind of faith they have when they leave the nest. Uh, I think that that's very important. Um, uh, when I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, uh, I had 110 class, or the 110 of us in our class, and they have a, they had, at the time they had a very strong Newman Center, just like at S and T, and I took full advantage of the Newman Center. Uh, but I just want to add a little bit more to what you asked. And, and I know that it's amazing that there are people in this world that do not re recognize Catholics as Christians. Um, so it's, it's okay to be Catholic in a public institution, but at least I, I took advantage of the Newman Center environment, but I also took advantage of what I found in my own classmates. And it's interesting, and I'll give a shout out to Dan Vondahar who does this all the time when he makes sales calls. 
you want to you want to have your child keep their antenna up and always be aware of maybe a bookmark or a, a book or a calendar or they're wearing a, a cross for a piece of jewelry or something that might stimulate a potential discussion or a relationship uh, when I was in medical school, by the time I was a sophomore, second year, uh, myself and 14 other of my classmates started a Bible study, and we met once a week in the uh, nursing school at the University of Missouri, and we ultimately uh, became founding members of a student chapter of the Christian Medical and Dental Association at the University of Missouri in Columbia which is still thriving today. So just because they go to a public institution doesn't mean there are other like-minded people like her. She just needs to keep her antennas up uh, and like Father Lampy said, continue to pray. Most importantly, receiving encouragement from home. Um, those are all good things, but they can do it. When I talk to someone about like, you know, does God exist or whatever, it's usually to my best friend, one of my best friends from college, and he's a Catholic, he went to Catholic school, and then all of a sudden he started listening to like Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then he goes, okay, well these guys sound pretty smart, they know what they're talking about, and I said, okay, well yeah, but God too, like, all these things are saying could be possible through God, and all that stuff, so if I'm talking to someone, say my friend next time I talk to him, so I'm going to call him after this, um, and I say, listen, I just, you know, went and heard these guys talk and they said essentially what you said, Mr. Keys, like, what they're saying could be, that could be the truth. Like the Big Bang, okay, that might be what God did. No one knows for sure. And I, my stance is usually, okay, well, maybe that might be the actual truth of it. But his stance is usually, well, this is what they're proving right now. Like with a quantum mechanic theory or something like that you know the big bang theory well this is what they proved and then I I always try to get them to see it's not just what they prove but it's like beyond that and if you open your mind enough to look beyond what you don't like what you know to what you might not know and apply that to it that's where you might see where God exists so if I'm in conversation with him and it kinda ends with me saying okay well maybe what can I say to someone who's saying well this is what's proven well, Instead of just leaving it like, okay, well, maybe. Let me use the, the uh, other microphone. That's what I use. Um, as you probably know, Stephen Hawking died uh, recently. This is a quote he made in 1988. He said, physics is just a set of rules and equations. What it is that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe. The usual approach of science of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the question of the question of why there should be the universe for the model to describe. So what science is constantly doing is it's asking the what and the how question, but they don't ask why. Why is there a universe? Why is, does this happen? And that for us as humans, is the question, why am I here? Not, how does my elbow work? You know, those are all very interesting. And, you know, science is really, really interesting. Medicine is so inter interesting. But it's a question, those are just steps to lead you to knowing why you're here on this earth. And when they talk about the Big Bang Theory, well, there's nothing in the Big Bang Theory that goes against what we know. You know, we say God created it out of nothing. That's exactly what the Big Bang Theory says. Uh, so we have really no complaints about that. Uh, so I would just approach it that way. You can say that. And then also the other aspect I mentioned about miracles. You can turn it around on them and say, well, look, here's, a, here's an article on the uh, 
Eucharistic miracle at Lanciano. And you can show them that. And you can show all the physical, scientific, medical measurements they've made on that. And ask them, why would that be like that? If not to show us that there is really something in the Eucharist that transcends what is normal. So, so you, can, you can add in your own things to it. Okay. I got some, like, I don't know. And, and now a second question. This is, I just got another question. <laughs> okay, so that being said, yeah, I understand that the, like, God wouldn't say that the Big Bang didn't happen. Um, I guess it, it wouldn't be something that I could, like, instill in him, because I'm, essentially what he did in college was like, okay, well, if we're just going to butt heads, he went over, drew a chart, and he said, okay, if you look at it like this, it's actually probably in my best interest to just believe in God in case I die and there is a God. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that kind of takes faith out of it. And that, that, I mean, that wasn't the point of my argument to say, okay, just believe it, but I guess believe th because of faith. Is there anything you could say that would make them look into it from a faith perspective, as opposed to like science. Father. <laughs> well, it sounds like he was talking about Pascal's wager, um, whether or not God exists, and what that means to uh, the individual. Because um, if he if he does exist, exist, you do believe in him, and you follow what he asks, then there's the uh, infinite reward of heaven. Um, but if he does exist, you don't believe, you don't follow, then you have the infinite punishment. Um, but uh, there's other aspects to it as well. Um, and that wager can be like a starting point towards uh, a faith. Um, and Pascal, when he proposed that wager, it was never his intention that it would stop there, but that the person would actually take an interest in exploring the faith to go deeper. Um, and so just simply saying, oh, well, then I, I guess I better believe in God and then stop there. Well, if you, if you know anything about scripture, Jesus didn't say, just believe in me. I mean, if we're completely honest, the devil believes in God and that didn't save him. Um, you have to do the will of God. Um, you have to act on that belief and follow God, not just simply believe and say, okay, I'm done. Um, and so what Pascal was trying to do was start that journey for the individual. Um, is that helpful, or did you want me to respond to more of that question? No, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I just like, how do you get them to take a leap of faith, if you will? Well, you can't, you can't force a person to suddenly believe. They have to choose it for themselves. They have to accept that grace from God. Um, what, what we can do um, is we can eliminate the obstacles that prevent that from happening. So like they can say, oh, Genesis 1 and creation, the, what we know from science, those two don't match. Well, my presentation was showing that there's not actually a conflict there. So that removes that barrier. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't then propel them to make that leap of faith. It just removes the obstacles so that they are able to when the opportunity comes, when they are willing uh, to receive that grace. Okay. One more? Okay, one more for Dr. Boland. He, he gets final comments too. Okay. <laughs> This one, I just thought of it when I was walking up. Might be a little bit out there. I watch a lot of YouTube. Um, so you're saying about like where the breath of God exists in the brain. I was listening to a couple scientists. I think they were scientists. I don't know. But I listened to podcasts and stuff, and they talk about the pineal gland, and they refer to it as the seat of the soul. Did, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. If I should stop watching YouTube. <laughs> um, no, uh, the pineal gland is not the seat of the soul. Uh, we all have one pineal gland and it serves very little purpose. Uh, we think that it's the reservoir for melatonin, which helps regulate our sleep-wake cycles. Uh, and so if you're... If you're into ethereal things, 
or new age things and you're into meditation and breathing and sleep-wake cycles, meditation, you might think that the pineal gland is the seat of God, but it's not. <laughs>
Yeah, it seems like a natural thing yes. for a, a community like St. Louis, which does yes. have a, a long and strong history uh, of, of the faith. Dr. Keller, your involvement with ITES, how did all that happen? Um, it was probably a divine providence. I wound up going to, uh, I lectured at the 9 o'clock Mass for 30 years, and one morning I didn't get up quite so early, so I went to 11 o'clock. Linda was there. She saw me across the room, and so uh, she asked me then, and um, I agreed. And uh, as far as science and faith, um, um, a lot of people think that, um, you know, they, 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 um, think that you know that, that faith is just something very superficial whereas the more you look into the Catholic faith it is so rich and so deep and so beautiful and so profound the more you study it the more you learn about it and um, for people that are scientists that are looking at nature for the answers if they don't find God they become atheistic or some people become pantheistic but if you if you look at nature um, and look at life as a gift from God, the, the faith is what brings it all together. So I got involved at St. Anselm's because of uh, Linda, and uh, um, we took, it, took, it took off from there. I can have the idea, okay, yes, your faith and, and science are compatible, but how does that relate to, to what I do every day? Um, in, in, your, in your work as a chemist, um, okay. Have you have you run into situations where where you either had to decide one or the other, or had to struggle to keep them in balance? In any way? I've never had a conflict per se of um, you know this this project goes against my faith, or I'm being asked to do something that I have a problem with my faith. I think I saw it actually more the other way around when I was involved in an AIDS project in the uh, 1980s and at that time um, even though the CDC had, had, had ruled you know there it, it's pretty straightforward you know how, how um, HIV is passed along there was still a big fear in the community there were a lot of jokes being made about it and at that particular time um, when I was with the scientists and we were working on this AIDS project I felt more in communion with my scientist friends than I did f friends and you know within the parish and just in the public I, I just felt that you know we were doing what was right scientifically as opposed to the general public that was just showing a fear of AIDS. And what about the faith community at that point? Um, the, the faith community was pretty much mirroring the public community, very much so. The, you know, when, when I would go to various events, you know, it was, it was common that, you know, when I left, I was like, heard another AIDS joke. And I mean, you know, the, the, um, the religious were not immune to it either. You know, they were they were susceptible to the same fears as the public. Has it gotten any better? Um, well, certainly, I think everything, as far as with, um, particularly with AIDS, it, it is better, but it's just sometimes, I think, even though the facts are there, sometimes there's still fear, and it, it takes time for everyone to adjust to, you know, it's okay. Have you had occasions where, where the you saw the, the possibility of science and faith butting heads or that you had to try to strike a balance there? Not so much because I was fortunate in that I worked my entire career at a Catholic hospital, St. John's Mercy, a uh, Sisters of Mercy institution. And so as, um, as a Catholic institution, they didn't perform abortions, they didn't sell birth control pills in the pharmacy. But also back when I joined in the early 80s, the Sisters of Mercy were there in presence and there were lots of doctors, mainly older doctors, and lots of technologists and nurses that I would see going to Mass every day. And so the faith was very strong. I myself had fallen away from the faith after high school, but I remember in studying embryology, the development of the human, and all the things that could possibly go wrong, it was amazing that the babies ever came out right. 
The other thing is that um, there were life and death situations in my practice as a radiologist. We would have to do invasive procedures, putting needles in blood vessels or in lungs or whatever, where there was a potential that you could hurt somebody or they could actually die. And as they say, there are no atheists in foxholes. I was reminded of what Socrates said when he was told he was the wisest man in Greece, and he went and talked to the other philosophers who thought they were all very wise, and Socrates knew that he was a fool, so he realized, I am the wisest of all. And medicine is very, very humbling because there's times where you don't think it's going to go right and you're praying and the patient turns around and gets better because of, uh, of, uh, of divine uh, uh, providence. So I'm remembering what G.K. Chesterton said, the secret of all life is in humility and gratitude. And um, um, medicine, very, very humbling because we could do procedures and you do everything just the way you're supposed to and as carefully as you can and you might have a situation where the patient has a stroke or might bleed to death. So it's very humbling and from that humility comes um, a deeper faith and gratitude to God for all the gifts. As much as we might know about chemicals and how they interact with each other or react, we don't know how that happens. I mean, we can't see it happening. We know that it does because we can see the, the evidence of it. So it's one of the things, like Dr. Keller says, the more we know, the more we know we don't know. That's very true. That's that's very, very true. So um, that's why there continues to be more and more discoveries from the scientists because there's always an unknown out there. In your professional associations, has do you ever have experience with people who know your, your, the depth of your faith, who know how important the faith is to you, does that ever seem to be a drawback? Does that seem to be something that other scientists receive negatively or perceive negatively? In my own personal experience, I've never, I've, I've never seen it. I've never experienced it from, from my own community of scientists and the, the jobs that I have had within my career, it was never a factor for me. I never saw it, no, never. And Dr. Keller, in your, in your experience, has that, has that ever been an issue with colleagues? Um, you know what, I, I grew up cradle Catholic, and uh, I never experienced anti-Catholicism until I was at work at St. John's Mercy when one of the secretaries um, challenged me because she said, oh, you're Catholic and so therefore you follow a false gospel and therefore you're going to hell. And uh, I won't mention what other religion she was, but I had never encountered that before because everybody I grew up with was similar to me. When my children grew up, they went to a school that had Hindus and uh, people of the Islamic faith and Presbyterians and they had, to, they had to explain their faith and so they would come and ask me questions. So. Um, never really met any, uh, any anti-Catholicism because of working at a Catholic hospital. One thing I wanted to point out about our society and the secular society and looking for truth, science can answer maybe the questions how, but it doesn't answer the questions why. And only religion can answer the why questions. And so um, for those people that are, that are thinking that all the knowledge can be pursued by truth, and none of it by faith. It's sort of a dead end because they're they're never going to be um, they're never going to get the answer. They're going to wind up like the philosopher Nietzsche, who winds up going insane. And you know mm -hmm. the uh, I, and I don't know a great many scientists. I think this is as close as I've ever been to two actual scientists <laughs> in a very long time. But um, scientists in general have a reputation sometimes for being a little out there. Um, but this idea of truth, and, and in, the, in our society particularly, there seems to be an effort to relativize truth. Truth is whatever you say truth is. You know, there's your truth and my truth and, and Margie's truth. As a scientist, that can't work, can it? Um, not when you're talking scientific data, per se. No, we have um, data drive. So, in the, you know, as the science goes, when you're moving a project along, um, certainly you need data to 
um, to, to move the whole project along and to, to direct it in which way it's going to go is going to be based on that data. There has to be an objective truth, doesn't it, Doc? Well, like for instance, when my son was young, he wanted to do all the things he didn't want to do, and uh, I kept telling him some things you can't do. And I said, for instance, scientific fact, gravity. You may think that you can fly, but if you jump off a 12-story building, you're going to splat on the sidewalk, okay? And so there are rules that the Father is giving you to protect you, and these are what the commandments and the teachings of the church are, because there's things you don't understand and truths you don't understand, and if you try to fly in the face of those, you're going to wind up um, getting hurt. And so, um, uh, again, the, 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 the great attributes of God the truth and beauty and goodness. Truth is just one of those. And our, our reason, our logic seeks truth, but it's only part of the answer. And then you have goodness, which our will is looking for in morality, and that's only part of the answer. But then there's also the oneness and the beauty of God, which ties it all together. And to, so to separate, to separate the truth from goodness and beauty is to, is to wander down uh, uh, a dark pathway that doesn't have an end. What would you say to somebody who, who says to you, Margie, I, I understand your, where you're coming from on faith and science being compatible and, and mutually supportive, but how do I put that to work for me? What, what would you recommend? Um, in, in my particular field, I was a chemist in the pharmaceutical industry, and as a scientist, our whole goal is to try and help sick people. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. And in that regard, I can't imagine how you can separate them. I mean, it's what, it's, it's what you know, I, certainly God would approve, that you would choose a career where you're out there trying to help people. Well, what advice would you give somebody? Oh. Uh, there's there's people that have different personalities. Mine is more from the aesthetic side. I'm more of a right brain person, more the beauty, the imagination, the poetry. And there's some people that are more from the left brain side, more logic and reason, etc. And um, um, as I said, there's only so far you can get with reason. Saint Augustine famously said, for people that had questions, believe first, and then you will understand. Well, that's hard to do. But also, um, Peter Kreeft uh, points out in his books, the next step from that is love first, and then you will believe and understand. And so with Christianity, if you want to understand it all, you have to realize that you're not the center of the universe, and you have to realize that God is not an impersonal watchmaker that wound everything up, and it's uh, all up to us, that it's a personal relationship, uh, and that when you're dealing with persons, it's a relationship with love. And who understands you better? Uh, a psychiatrist who can talk to you, uh, or your best friend who's not very bright that loves you dearly. The person that understands you is the person that loves you. And Christianity is about a relationship between the person of Christ and the persons of the Trinity and us. And in order to understand that, you cannot get there with truth and reason. You have to believe and you have to love and then you'll understand so my answer would be is would be pray do good works uh, do things for the other children of God realize that you are a son and daughter of God that we are wounded by original sin but we have the beauty of the church teachings and the sacraments which are God's gift to us that will give us the grace to perfect our nature I find it interesting, and, and others might also, as a man of science, that you said, okay, you're sort of a right brain person. One would expect, I would think, that a man of science would be more of a left brain individual. Do you, does that cause any conflict? I took that Myers-Briggs personality <laughs> index when I was young, and um, mine is uh, similar to apparently what Thomas Jefferson's was. My background, my mother was Irish, and my background is more poetry and language uh, um, and not so much logic, etc. But I wanted to do something worthwhile with my life, and I realized, well, 
you can't buy groceries much if you're writing poetry, you know. So I wanted to do something worthwhile, I wanted to do something to help people, and I had the, the right brain compassion side. Um, I'm always quoting Chesterton, but Chesterton said that the left and the right lobes of the brain are separated by an abyss which only Christ can cover. And uh, he said the people that are left-brained, the mathematical kind, they keep adding up number after number that adds up to nothing. And the right brain people with the image and the poetry and the artistry keep painting endless pictures of nobody. What gets the, the left brain and the right brain, the faith and the science together, is Christ. And Chesterton said, Christ is what crosses the abyss between those two, or between faith and science. And he called Christ the divine embodiment of our dreams. And so in order to put together what I call the horizontal, the reason, the earth science, okay, and the vertical, the faith, the revelation, where those two meet is in beauty and in the person of Christ. And you, uh, Margie, Dr. Keller mentioned earlier that, you know, things like beauty and truth and goodness, these are all gifts from God, as are the, the sacraments and so on. But actually, both faith and science or reason are two of the greatest gifts that God has given us. And for people who think that they're incompatible, it just doesn't make sense that, that a loving father would give, give you two gifts that don't get along with each other. Does, does that... Does that make it? No, that makes that makes perfect sense, and um, I I very much agree with you that uh, we each have all our individual gifts from God, and it is up to us what to do with that gift and how to use how to use that gift. And so, if 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 someone is uh, strong in the sciences, that's that's a gift. And I think very much that God would want individuals to use the gifts that he has provided. But you can't ignore one gift in the use of another. No, you can't. But you, you wouldn't have that gift if it wasn't for God. You wouldn't, you know, that's, that's why they go hand in hand. Because you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have it if, if God chose, that, you know, not to provide it to you. One of the great novels... Uh, Lou Wallace's novel, Ben-Hur. Uh, one of the lessons in there that, that the, the, the protagonist learned when he was a galley slave is that if you only row one side of the boat, you're going to wind up way off balance. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. We've, we've the faith and science, you know, those are two, two sides of the same boat, that we're all in the same boat. And we have to row both sides. Otherwise, we're, we're going to go around in circles now. I remember um, reading about St. Augustine and his confessions because he was a pig and his mother, of course, was St. Monica. And uh, um, he uh, was eventually converted by St. Ambrose, but he started reading Plato and Aristotle and he thought to himself, gosh, these ancient pagans were so smart. How did they get to be so smart? Or how did they know all these truths? And so um, St. Augustine took everything from Plato that he could that fit Christianity and threw out what didn't fit. But the Greeks had this idea that uh, the, the, the universe is orderly and it makes sense and, and that we have a brain and we can understand. Then you have Judaism mixed in with that of, of God the Father. Then you take Christianity and mix that in. God gave you a brain. He gave you reason. He loves you. He wants you to know more about him. And so only in Western civilization was there the idea of progress and the idea of knowledge because the more you learn, the more, the more you, you, you can understand. And as far as scientists, even Einstein said earlier in the last century, the most amazing thing to him was that the universe was orderly and it was knowable and it, 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 uh, it was harmonious. And, um, what, what Christians, I think, tried to understand is that, okay, God wrote the two books. He wrote the book of Scripture and he wrote the book of nature. And the book of nature is for us to explore and to understand so we can come to know him better and, uh, and come to know and love him.
I'm Marcia Mertens, and uh, I'm a family physician. Um, I've been a family physician for over 33 years, and I did my undergraduate uh, training at the universe. I'm sorry, at uh, William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, a small liberal arts college. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, and then I went to medical school at the University of Missouri Columbia School of Medicine. I did a three-year residency in family medicine at the old St. John's Mercy Medical Center in St. Louis, Missouri. And for over 30 years, I taught um, medical students and residents. Um, and now I'm in a practice with Mercy uh, down in Hillsboro, Missouri also. Um, so that's my background. And when I was in college and through medical school, um, as I learned more and more about science and especially about the human body, I, my faith became stronger and stronger and stronger that God is real and that he's out there and that he's really quite amazing when you look at what he's done with the human body. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So if you, if you look at just organ systems like our special senses, our uh, a circulatory system, our respiratory system, our gastrointestinal system, you look at that very, fairly superficially, it's pretty complex how it all works. And then if you get down to looking at our tissues and how the tissues work, that's even more amazing. And then when you get down to the cells and how the cells work, that's even more amazing. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about those different levels. And scientists and physicians can really spend <coughs> their whole careers learning about science, learning about medicine, learning about the human body, and still only touch on the surface because there's so much to know. And as science changes, there's even more to know. You know, when, when I got out of medical school in 1982, medicine knew about this much. And now, you know, 35 years later, medicine knows a whole lot more. Um, and that's still only a little bit of what there is to know about the human body. So, so if you look at some of the advances we've made in medicine, um, and you look at what man can do to help uh, his fellow man as far as helping the human body. Um, there's things we can do like try to replace joints. Joints seem like they're pretty simple, but even with all the technological advances that we've had over so many years, uh, uh, artificial joint, if you're lucky, might last a person 15 years, where the joints that God gave us, they last for most people their entire lifetime. I think that's pretty amazing. And there's a lot of joints in the body that man can't replace. They're just not very feasible. You look at things like uh, an artificial finger joint. Our fingers are quite amazing. Our shoulders, because of their location and how they work. Our ankles. Uh, you look at prosthetic limbs for someone who's lost an arm or a hand. Even though they're getting better all the time, they're only recently coming up with ways for a person to maybe be able to feel a li little bit with an artificial hand. And it sounds like a simple thing, but if you think about how you button your shirt every day, <coughs> you put on a shirt with buttons, if you cannot feel the fabric and you cannot feel the buttons, you would have to look at every single one to be able to get it buttoned, where you don't even think about it. You just button it right down because you feel everything. Go ahead. What can't man replace? You look at the human eye. So small, but so intricate. Dave touched on this a little bit, but you look at the simplest part of the eye, which is probably the cornea, the clear part that covers your pupil. Even that, man cannot replace very well. They've come up with artificial corneas, but they're only a last resort for someone whose body will reject a cornea transplant from someone who's died. Our lenses, in our own eyes, our own natural lenses, they can change shape constantly. When we look at things, we look at something far away, we look at something near, our eye accommodates to that. It focuses, it focuses. When somebody has a cataract and their lens gets clouded and they get an art artificial lens, their lens has, that lens has a lot more limitations of what it can do. And then you get to the really complex part where you have the rods and the cones on the back of the retina and those turn into the optic nerve, and that goes to your brain. Go ahead, next slide. This, talk, this shows a little bit of that. The lens is in the front. I'm sorry, the cornea is in the front. The lens is the white behind it, and the uh, retina going into the optic nerve. Go ahead, Bill. So um, computers have been 
trained to recognize images, so it's one form of artificial intelligence, but their ability to recognize images is pretty limited. If you change something as simple as the lighting, the angle that it looks at it, how, how fine the picture is, what the resolution is, the accuracy of those computers, those artificial intelligence, to recognize an image is very, very limited. It's not as good as a person. Go ahead. So animals can see things too, but man can not only see things, but man can read words and symbols, and, and those words and symbols don't just mean something concrete, but they mean things like feelings and emotions, and it, and it affects us, and I think that's pretty special. So, go ahead. So um, if you look at brains versus artificial intelligence, and you look at a little toddler, they just, their brain is just barely starting, it's learning. Their brain is so powerful. Their brain can, they can see things, they can make noises, they can hear things, they can learn, they can talk, they can walk. They can do an amazing amount of things with that little brain that's just starting. And then you look at the other end of the spectrum, my 84-year-old grand, my mother, we go to visit her. She's always on her little iPad playing Scrabble online. And she can beat the computer on a regular basis playing Scrabble. You know, and here she is, her brain is 84 years old. It's been aging, it's been deteriorating, but she's still amazing. That's from God. Um, and you look at these machines, this artificial intelligence, and they've only been able to do they're trained for certain, they're, they're built, they're designed for certain tasks, and that's all they can do. One might be able to do this, and might, one might be able to do this, but they can't do that multitude of things that our human brain can do. So how about our lungs? Our lungs are really amazing again. Uh, our lungs can um, exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide um, much more efficiently than anything that's out there. So. Uh, there's this doctor who's developing kind of a portable artificial lung for people who need one. And they're testing it in sheep. But it's still, it's gigantic, it's heavy, and it still requires oxygen. They can't just breathe the air. They have to have pure oxygen going into that artificial lung for it to work. And this is why a lung transplant is really the only good option for somebody whose lungs fail them completely. It's not perfect, but it's better than an artificial lung. Go ahead. So artificial hearts are similar. Um, they've been researched for decades, and we've had over 50 years of scientists trying to come up with a really good artificial heart, because once your heart gives out, you either get a tra heart transplant or you're going to die. Go ahead. But it's really, the human heart is really irreplaceable. The total artificial heart, the best one that they have out there right now, it's only considered a very temporary measure. If somebody's heart goes out completely and they're waiting for a heart transplant and they can't get one, then they might use this total artificial heart for a little while. And that's because it has a high rate of complications. It's not as good as our heart. So this next picture will show you a little bit why. The human heart is on the right. and. Um, you know, I think when I was younger and I learned about the heart, I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, have these valves in these chambers and the blood goes in and the blood goes out. But you, when you really look at it, <laughs> it's even more amazing than that because it's got its own little built-in electrical system. It's got its own little built-in pacemaker. That is controlled by the involuntary part of our brain. Makes the heart beat in a synchronized fashion. The blood goes through the chambers goes through the lungs, goes, goes out to the body. We have arteries on the muscle that are feeding the muscle, bringing it nutrients, oxygen, making it contract, keep feeding, keep us alive. It's small, it, uh, it works great. You look at the total art artificial heart, it's pretty bulky, it has to be implanted in the person, and they have to have tubes running out of their body to go to this backpack size thing that runs their artificial heart and then that has to be charged on a regular basis so and it, it's not even very good so it has lots of complications go ahead how about our kidneys um, some of you know somebody who's had uh, dialysis had to be on dialysis had a transplant 
dialysis is a burden to people. They have to go be hooked up to a machine for three or four hours, three days a week. They can't go out of town, go on vacation without making arrangements because their blood has to be filtered, keep everything in line so that they don't, they don't die. And some people will have peritoneal dialysis, which you can do at home, requires huge amounts of fluid, requires being hooked up to the machine. If you go somewhere, you have to take all that stuff with you. And, and even with dialysis, it doesn't keep a person's blood perfect like our kidneys do. It gets it to where it's tolerable so they can stay alive, but a lot of things are not right. Go ahead. If you look at the reserve in our organs, it's pretty amazing too. So many times organs get damaged by disease or sometimes by things that we do like smoking or drinking too much, heart attacks. And you look at those organs, a heart attack of victim, their heart may be damaged quite massively by a heart attack, but with the right medicines and with time and with God, their hearts can heal. Sometimes hearts will go from being very damaged, very poor functioning pumps and they may recover completely. I think that's pretty amazing. You look at people who have COPD and emphysema, many of those people, even though their lungs are heavily damaged, they still may be able to walk around and function and do things better than somebody could with one of these artificial lungs. Go back. Um, chronic kidney disease, many people live for years with significant impairment of their kidneys, but they are still able to function. And people who've had strokes, they may have complete paralysis on one side of their body, and yet their brain eventually repairs, compensates, and sometimes you see people make a complete recovery where they can walk and talk again and they weren't able to. Go ahead. One more thing about organ transplants. If someone does have an organ transplant, they have to be on anti-rejection drugs, and those are very potent drugs um, they make a person very susceptible to serious infections because their immune system is dampened down so much. And did you realize that when a woman is pregnant, the baby that's in her, half of the proteins and antigens in that baby are foreign to that mother. They come from the father, and yet her body does not reject that baby. I think that's pretty miraculous. That baby stays and thrives in the mother even though it's foreign tissue. I think we, science needs to learn something about that when it comes to organ transplants to make organ transplants more successful. Now I'm going to get down on the smaller level. We're going to go down to cells in the subcellular level. So the picture on the left is um, just a general schematic of a human or an animal cell. It has a lot of things inside of it. And then the one on the right is DNA. And it's got a very complex structure. And if you look at our bodies, they're made up of about 37.2 trillion cells. Lots and lots of cells in our bodies. And then each cell has somewhere between 100 and 1,000 copies of DNA in it. Go ahead. This is a really great website that Bill showed me. It's called reasons.org. And there's a lot of different scientists that have blogs on there. And they write a lot of very complex stuff. Even as a scientist and person who study a lot of chemistry and biochemistry and all that stuff, some of this stuff goes way over my head. But there's stuff, stuff on there that you would understand and you would really uh, appreciate. But he talks about how when he was a graduate student studying biochemistry, it made him really want to become a Christian because he realized how complex everything is and how it's not an accident. Animals, humans, none of that stuff happened by accident. It was designed. Go ahead. And he talks about how he left a Fortune 500 company because he wanted to join this Reasons to Believe, which their website is now called reasons.org, because he thought it was the most important thing he could do to communicate to people how science, there's very powerful scientific evidence being uncovered every day for God's existence and how reliable scripture is. Go ahead. So he talks about how Scientists have now determined that they can use those tiny little DNA particles that we have a hundred or a thousand copies of in our cells, and he, they can use those now as a wire because they can conduct electrical current at very, very, very fast speeds. So they're looking at using DNA inside of um, 
medical devices and inside of tiny little devices. I think that's astounding. But, um, he said, again, considering the wire properties of DNA, it is not madness to think that a creator exists and played a role in life's genesis. Go ahead. So this is again a picture of DNA. And now the other thing he talks about on his blog is how it's being used as a storage tool, which I found very, very fascinating. Go ahead. If you think about it, at the moment of conception, the tiny chromosomes that are found in that one cell that is formed has enough information to form an entire human body with all those complexities we're talking about. That's a lot of data in that DNA. And what's even more amazing is that single cell that starts, it differentiates into nerve cells, muscle cells, lung cells, skin cells. How does that happen? I mean, if you, it's, it's something. Go ahead. And he talks about how we know so much data can be stored on DNA that they started looking at using it to store other data. And he talks about how there's probably, this, this figure might even be old because I'm sure it goes up every single day, but at the time he wrote this, 44 trillion gigabytes of data in the world. Tons and tons of data. It takes a lot to store all that data. Go ahead, Bill. And compounding the problem is the current ways that we have of storing data, um, it degrades, it breaks down. So magnetic disk, tapes, all that stuff, it breaks down. Go ahead. But because DNA is so good at storing data, um, it's been looked at as basically the next great thing to store data because it is digitized. The data that's on DNA is digitized. And they've, they've encoded entire computer programs, operating systems, movies, all kinds of things on tiny little pieces of DNA. Go ahead. They determined that about a half pound of DNA could probably store all of the data in the world. All of the data in the world. Go ahead. This is a little picture I found on uh, the web. This is actually from a hacker magazine, and it's saying basically the same thing, that that's the new digital storage. Go ahead. So conclusions for me, um, I think if you just look at the human body, in the science of the human body, it's very convincing that we are not an accident, that we didn't just kind of evolve, we didn't come from nowhere, that there was an all-knowing creator who's very powerful, highly intelligent, who created us as complex beings. And uh, as I work as a physician day to day and I see uh, how the human body works and again, things like amazing reparations of injuries. Um, I'm just convinced every day that God's out there and he knows what he's doing. So, Any questions? I got a question. Uh -huh. Did you uh, happen to read anything about um, whether DNA can exist outside of the human body? I mean, how would they use that to store data and have something <coughs> that's transportable and storable? You know, I didn't read the details on that. I can't really tell you. Okay. Yeah, but I, I would think, in my mind, when I thought, I did think about it a little bit, but I didn't actually have time to look it up and, and figure it out, but, you know, there's DNA and um, plasmids and um, microorganisms. That's my guess on how they can do it, is just have DNA from microorganisms actually store some of this stuff. Okay. 